Euzu billahi mineşşeytanirracim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi rabbil alamin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala eşrafil mursalin. Seyyidina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi el-burril mayamin. All praise, all thanks belong to Allah alone, to God alone, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And the greetings of blessing and peace we bid to the Prophet Muhammad and to all Allah's Prophets and to the Prophet's family and companions, the righteous all. And we bid the same greetings to ourselves and to all God's righteous worshippers. Whoever God guides, nobody can mislead, but whoever God Misleads. There is no guide for them. Today, inshallah, we will start with the uh, interpretation of Surah Al-Kahf, of Surah 18. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has recommended to read this Surah or the beginnings of it, the first ten verses. when the Antichrist appears to seek protection from the Antichrist. And this surah, we are supposed to read it every Friday. There are some who even memorized it, some of the companions memorized it and loved it very much. I talked to you about this surah before about how some of the verses um, seem to be pointing to the emergence and the evolution of Imam W. D. Muhammad and before him his father, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The Antichrist is um, a phenomenon of the end days. And the end days started probably with the coming of Jesus, alayhi salam, Jesus, peace be upon him. The Quran says that he, he is the sure sign for the hour. He's knowledge for the hour. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also told us that he and the hour are like this, like the two fingers together. The Quran itself tells us many times that the hour has come close and that the end days have arrived. What God has threatened has, as final punishment for those in the world who do bad that that has already started. Before we start with the interpretation of Surat Al-Kahf, and I will go through it from verse 1 to the last verse, inshallah, as I come to talk to you. We will go through uh, some basic definitions The last age is the age in which we live, the last age of the world. As I said, many verses in the Quran tell us that the hour has come close and that um, with the coming of the Islam, or even before that with the coming of Jesus, 600, six centuries earlier, the end days have started. (coughs) 
worship, to worship someone is to accept him as a god, as a supreme authority, as the source of the supreme law, and to apply that law in one's life, in one's behavior. Or if you just apply that law in your life and in your behavior, you're implying that you are worshiping this person who made this law or this authority, this institution that made that law. If the supreme law in your life is someone, comes from someone other than God, then you are worshiping that God. Even if you recognize that authority or that person as the supreme legislator, the creator of supreme law, in a single issue. This is what we learn throughout the Quran. We don't have to cite verses for that. Every time you read the Quran, you will find that Allah is making this principle clear that we should not set rivals next to him, we should not make associates for him. A believer serves Allah, worships Allah, and the way you serve Allah is to accept that Allah alone has, um, is the sovereign, has sovereignty, has a supreme power. Nobody else can have supreme power. If you say, I worship Allah, and then somebody else or something else has supreme power in your life, then you're associating with Allah. The Quran, the last message of Allah, is the supreme law. And a believer applies the Qur'an to his life and to his behavior in every little thing, every big thing, every little thing. And without any hesitation or any discomfort, uh, the Qur'an makes it clear that if we have discomfort, then we are not believers. Um, the verse that uh, points that out very, one of the verses that points that out very clearly is verse 65 of Surah 4, Women. That if we have discomfort, then we're not true believers. When someone applies the Quran that way and has no hesitation, no discomfort left in their heart, and has practiced the Quran for a while, then we say, Iman, faith, has entered into his heart. As someone strives for more excellence in their application of the Quran, they reach the highest degree, which is called Ihsan, excellence, or having beautiful behavior, or a beautiful soul. And these are the people that Allah loves and has declared in the Qur'an many times that he loves them. They are sometimes described as al-muttaqeen, the one who are God-conscious. Sometimes they are the patient, those who are patient. Islam, deen, faith, is two parts. Patience and gratefulness. And so it is no wonder that when you um, have acquired through patience that you have reached the highest degree of, of Iman. And the angel Jibreel salam, described, defined Ihsan when he visited the Muslims in the form of a human being. He asked the Prophet to, dis to make definitions, but he came and he, in he told the Prophet 
those things. And then he asked the prophet, and the prophet answered, and every time the prophet answered, Jibreel said, that's correct. So Jibreel, the angel of revelation, may Allah's peace be upon him, taught us that Ihsan, excellent practice of Islam, of faith, is to worship God as if you see him. That's what the prophet said as the angel was there. And the angel agreed. If you don't see him, he sees you. And when you are there, when you are at the excellent level, then your heart is filled. Your heart is filled with the light of Allah. And you have basira, spiritual insight, and you have firasa, spiritual intuition. Some people refer to that state of, of ihsan, of excellence, as tasawwuf. And from that term, tasawwuf, we have the word Sufi. But the proper term is not to associate that with, with Sufis, some of whom are goofy Sufis. Ihsan is a proper term of, of orthodox or of, of righteous and rightly guided practice of, of uh, the Quran, Islam. It's part of Islam, Ihsan. And it, it is wrong to attribute it to, to a group of people who might follow Islam correctly or might not. But sometimes when you, when you see reference to tasawwuf, that is all that is meant. Ihsan, excellence. Originally, that was all they meant. Later, uh, people made out of Sufism what they wanted to make out of it. Sunnah is the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, method. Sunnah means method. It's his method in applying the Quran to one's behavior and to one's life. So following Sunnah, following the method of the Prophet in applying Quran is the right way to reach Iman because you reach Iman by applying the Quran for a while. That's when Allah's light starts entering your heart. You become a mu'min, you become a believer. A kafir, a disbeliever, a denier, a rejecter of faith, is someone who does not accept God to be the only God and the highest authority, the supreme authority. So the kafir would um, add one or more gods or one or more supreme authorities into his life. Or a kafir would reject the Quran or part of the Quran as a supreme law that determines people's behavior and their life. So a kafir would add a law from a different source. Now this is different from taking the Quran and based on the Quran adding new laws or adding new rules based on the Quran. But if you say, um, in this issue, I know the Quran says this, but this is my law. This is the, the law that I want to follow. I am not in Saudi Arabia, or I am not here, I'm not there. This is the law I'm going to follow. When you set the Quran aside and use something deliberately instead of the Quran, then you are a kafir, according to the definition of the Quran. At least you are committing an act of kufr. A kafir is someone who is pervasively committing acts of rejection of, of Allah, supreme authority, or rejection of Allah, 
the Quran, a rejection of the Quran as, as the, uh, the thing to live by. One way to, um, to act as a kafir is to be uncomfortable with something, with part of the Quran. People can be rejectors of Allah, or rejectors of the, the uniqueness of the role of Allah in their belief, or they can be rejectors in their behavior. There are people who say, La ilaha illallah, and, and the Quran is my supreme law in life. And then they cherry pick. They say, well, the, these verses are fine for me, but these verses, uh, I don't know. Or they, are, they hesitate in applying the Quran to their life. Or they put opinions, their own opinions, or other people's laws, or their own laws, above the Quran, in their practical behavior. That is... Um, a kafir in application. Uh, the reason I'm explaining all these terms is that uh, they are going to be used in, in Surah 18, in Surah Al-Kaf. It is not our business to point to people and say this person is, is a believer or this person is a kafir or this person is this and that. That is Allah's God's business alone. Most kufr, the, the noun from kafir is kufr, most denial and rejection of the Quran or of, um, of Allah as supreme authority is of the kind that we could call polytheism by belief. And that is adding a God to God or adding a supreme authority to God's supreme authority. Or practical shirk, practical polytheism, which is to treat something practically as if that is Allah or the supreme authority by, by submitting to this authority or placing the laws of this authority above the law of Allah. Or to say, I worship Allah alone. And then do that stuff. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what you say. If you practically do it, then you are practically committing the polytheism, the shirk. So what I'm saying is most denial, most denial... is of the form that is called polytheism. Every rejection of Allah or adding, every rejection of Allah leads automatically to having some devil, some shaitan, some uh, authority of Iblis play the role play the role of Allah in your life so every denial is polytheism ultimately the leaders of the polytheists on earth the Quran tells us in many places that the leaders of polytheism on earth are those of the children of Israel who reject the scripture they are the ones who said God has taken a son. One of them, Paul, made that claim. And the Christians followed him. And they made Jesus a God in addition to God. But the most dangerous kind of a, a polytheist, the most dangerous kind of a, of a rejecter, of a denier, of a kafir, is a hypocrite, the munafiq. He is someone who publicly declares that he is a Muslim, but secretly he is a polytheist. 
either by his belief or by his behavior, either in, in belief or in application. The Quran has declared, has, has defined hypocrites in the very beginning in verses 8 to 20 of Surah Al-Baqarah. And we have had talks about that. In order to expose all hypocrites on earth in the last age in which we live, in order to expose them, uh, we talked about Allah's intention to expose them when we explained the beginning of Surah 29. The spider, al ankabut Allah wants to separate. In that surah, Allah declares it. And, and elsewhere in the Quran, Allah says He wants to separate the good from the bad, the pure from the impure. And I had a talk about garbage collection, if some of you remember, where Allah, where I interpreted two verses from Surah 8. Al-Anfal, they talk about this principle. How Allah wants to uh, sweep the impure together and compact it, pile it up, and then throw it into to hell. In order to accomplish that in an organized way, Allah has created the Antichrist as a leader, an imam, for the hypocrites. The Antichrist exploits Allah's harsh tests, the fitna that Allah does. Allah alone is in charge. It's not that uh, Iblis or Shaitan or Satan or the Antichrist, the Jal, are in charge in running things on earth, although sometimes things look so bad um, at least in some countries where there's mayhem and murder and civil war and foreign invasion and you would think that the forces of evil are in charge Allah is always in charge these are harsh tests the harshest of tests the Quran mentioned those Allah has announced that he will test us in our souls meaning through killing. So the spread of killing is is announced in the Quran and the Prophet also pointed that out by telling us that there will be days when there will be a lot of senseless killing. So the purpose of the Antichrist and the Antichrist is referred to in many verses of the Quran Whenever Allah discusses um, hypocrites, Allah points to their leaders. In the first mention of hypocrites in verses 8 to 20 of Surah 2, Al-Baqarah, Allah refers to the secret leaders as devils, as shaitans, as satans. The Prophet wasallam explained that to us by saying that the Antichrist is the human son of a human mother, a Jewish mother, but that his father was a jinn. He has jinn properties. One hadith tells us that uh, that the jal inflates when he's angry. And uh, authentic hadith also explains to us that once one day he will come out he will inflate. And the Prophet repeatedly declared that um, the Jal will come out of Iran from the east, from Persia. And that the most dangerous thing that the Jal will do is to create false Islamic leadership, to create what the Prophet called misguiding imam, imams, misguiding imams, 
who are standing at the gates of hell and inviting people in. These are all uh, sensitive and difficult subjects, but um, there are things happening in the world, especially in Muslim countries, that require that we deal with these sensitive subjects, um, with current events that may or may not affect us here in the United States. We seem to be safe from that mayhem that is happening over there. But the mayhem that is happening over there certainly has to do with the activity of, uh, of the Antichrist. I will go a little bit longer to finish the, the introduction. As you see, it's, it's a very big subject. Verses 107 and 110, one of which is, um, is a slogan, the, uh, the call of this masjid, the reference to the masjid uh, which was um, based on taqwa, on God consciousness, on God fearing from the, fir from the first day, a masjid, uh, an organization that is based on purity, purity of hearts, and in which there are men who like to be pure. But uh, it is in those verses, uh, those verses actually talk and warn about Masjid Abdurrah. Masjid Abdurrah is a religious Muslim organization that is created by munafiks, uh, specifically by these misguiding imams. On the surface of it, it is a Muslim organization or a masjid. But the Quran explains that it was created by kafirs and it was created to be an instrument of sabotage and, and destruction and civil war and invasion, a spy station against Muslims. That is all in verse 107. Very brief mention of all those um, evil intentions from establishing a masjid, from establishing a religious organization. The purpose of that type of masjid, of that type of Islamic organization, is to destroy Islam. And while Dajjal, the Antichrist, leads the Munafiks on earth from his headquarters in Iran, as uh, the Prophet pointed us to, to, their, to his hideout, to his, the place he comes out from, Iblis, possibly his father, Satan, the, the leader of, of evil on earth, he leads the, the polytheists and the rejectors of faith from different centers all, all around the world. It is clear that um, since the uh, Antichrist creates those um, sabotage mosques, sabotage masjids, masjid al -Turad, that the Antichrist works for Satan. Now there are people who, who see the, the Antichrist as the leader of evil on earth. But you will find from when you look at current events that there is a, a rivalry between Satan and the Antichrist in, in practical terms. Those Muslims who are up to no good have rivalries with um, the polytheists, for example, who want to occupy Muslim countries. They're fighting with each other about who is going to invade Saudi Arabia, who is going to take Syria, who is going to take Libya. There is a war amongst the followers, between the followers of the Antichrist and the followers of Satan. 
We, are, we have been told already in the first definition in Surah Al-Baqarah, verses 8 to 20, we've been told that the munafiks, the hypocrites, whose leader is uh, the Antichrist and whose officers are the misguiding imams, the a'imma uh, mudallin, which the Prophet warned us about, the ones who established the sabotage mosques, that they are spies for the polytheists, and for the rejectors of, of faith. To balance that, Allah has created leaders for believers. The leaders of believers, while the leaders of the monafics, of the hypocrites, are called misguiding imams, the leaders of true believers are called Imam Mahdi or guided Imams. It's just the opposite. I had t mentioned before that I believed that Imam W.D. Muhammad was one of them. He guided the Muslims in America on the true path. He was transformed overnight as we are told in hadith and in, in Quran that Allah transforms these leaders and, and uh, prepares them to play their role increases their guidance and strengthens their hearts I talked about that when I talked about how the uh, certain verses of Surah Al-Kahf the cave point to Imam W.D. Muhammad and his father, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, how um, they were both used by Allah to reestablish or to establish Islam in America. There is a hadith that we will mention later that talks about three major Mahdi's other than Elijah and the Imam. The Hadith says that the first one, and this is about events in the Middle East, the first one prepares for the second, and the second has the same name as the Prophet Muhammad. His name is also Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And um, the second Mahdi, I talked about the second Mahdi when I interpreted verses from Surah Saba about the big sinkhole that would swallow an army that would march against this the second Mahdi who was called Muhammad ibn Abdullah and who will arise in Mecca and the third Mahdi is mentioned in Hadith and he is also referred to as the good man the righteous man and he's the one who, according to Hadith, will be meeting with Jesus, peace be upon him, when Jesus returns to earth. Now, I know there are Muslims, there are Muslim scholars who believe Jesus will not return to earth. But the Quran seems to be uh, pointing clearly to the return of, of Jesus when the hour is near and the Quran calls Jesus knowledge of the hour a sure sign one important uh, subject and I will mention it and then we're done with this introduction I had a talk about muhkam and mutashabih muhkam is the bulk of the Quran it's a type of, of verses of the Quran that are strong in their clarity. Um, they, uh, they are called muhkam because their meanings have been fastened firmly by the usage of the words, by the context. Context is where the words are used. The environment of the words is called a context. 
the text around the text. So muhkam context makes those verses clear, makes the meaning firm, ties it up. And that there is another kind that is called mutashabe, which means we think we know the meaning, but we don't. Now, one important kind of muhkam, of clear, is um, referred to in the Quran many times as amthal, as parables, as metaphors, as similitudes. Amthal, mathal, amthal. Amthal are muhkam, although some parts of them, as we will see, some, some aspects, some parts of a, of a parable might be closed to understanding and mutashabi. But amthal are meant, they are, although they are symbolic, they are not mutashabi. They're not, uh, mutashabi means, and as, as the Quran defines them in, in, in Ayah 7, verse 7 of Surah 3, Al-Imran, mutashabi, nobody can understand it except Allah. Nobody can figure it out except Allah. And I gave you an example there of, how Allah put to sleep the young men in the cave. We don't, nobody can figure out how, how Allah put them to sleep. But putting them to sleep is a metaphor, is a similitude. And all the talk about what happened with the young men in the cave is, is clear in what it tells us, that they hid in the cave. They, they withdrew into the cave with their faith because they were persecuted that is a metaphor that's a method and it is muhkam and we are asked by Allah to think about muhkam to think about the uh, symbolic expressions that are parables and similitudes and to apply them to our life to learn from them there are lessons for us so um, Please remember that this, the symbolic expressions that are, we are meant to ponder and apply to our lives are not mutashabi. Many scholars confuse the two and think that mutashabi, um, which is really the uninterpretable, includes the allegorical. Allegorical means, you know, like a parable, like a symbolism. But that would contradict the verse 7, which says nobody knows its meaning except Allah. But we, def we obviously know the meaning of parables. We can think about them and benefit from them. So they are not immune to our interpretation. On the contrary, we are asked to interpret them and benefit from them. The Quran is full of them. So they are muhkam, they are not mutashabi. Metaphors, parables, similitudes, which are the, the bulk of the Surah 18, about which we will talk in the future, are mostly of this type. They are muhkam and they are parables, they are similitudes. And we are supposed to think about them. I showed you an example of how we can look at this type of of muhkam, of this type of well-explained, well-defined meanings that we are supposed to think about. Sometimes we can have an idea as to what will happen in the future, uh, but only Allah knows the future. But we can analyze current events, definitely we can analyze current events by looking at parables, by looking at these similitudes. And I did do that in reference to current and historical events surrounding the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Imam W.D. Muhammad. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-mursaleen. Bismillahi rahman rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Maliki Yawm al إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم 
صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا